you for your word tonight and thank you for the opportunity to teach your word with boldness in Jesus precious name and every believer sees the powerful amen. amen lift your right hands to heaven let's release our faith together so say these words I am born of God I am born of the world the word of God is my nature I do not struggle to do the world I do the word naturally therefore today I will understand the word of his grace I will be built up by the end of this service I will never be the same never ever be the same again in Jesus name and every believer sees a powerful amen, amen. we well, want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network Facebook YouTube Twitter Instagram all of our social media community brothers and sisters online it's amazing and wonderful to have all of you in different continents and nations of the earth connected real time. And we're glad to have all of you as part of our church family. Together we are blanketing the earth with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. We also want to welcome the radio audience in Aquaibum. Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, we want to welcome you. We're glad you're part of our church family this evening. Invite a friend, a family member, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our social media community, do me the favor of sharing the video. Let's get the word to the ends of the air. Talk some people, invite some people. Join as many groups as possible. Let's get the word around the world. We want to welcome all our campuses around the world for being a part of the service this morning. Wherever you're watching, we love you. We're glad you're here, guys. It's going to be exciting tonight. Are we excited to be in church tonight? Glory to God. Can we celebrate our fellowship in God's word with a shout? Glory. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and your phones. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self tonight as we get in the world. Uh, 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 uh. So today is the last day of the first phase of 40 days, right? Mm -mm -mm. All right. It's exciting, isn't it? Is exciting hallelujah and it's a blessing that you are still here strong and alive and following and a part of this actively amen all right the book of second peter we're still examining brother paul's revelation of identification second peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16 second peter 3 15 and 16 an account that the long suffering of our lord is salvation even as our beloved brother paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you next verse as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction so we have examined through the course of this season that there's a Sophia, an insight that is given to Brother Paul. An insight, you know, in how he explains the Old Testament and how he explains the teachings of Jesus with clearer, clearer vocabulary. That's what Jesus meant in John chapter 16, verse 12 and 13. John chapter 16, verse 12 and 13, when he said to those disciples, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse. How be it? When he the spirit of truth is come. When he the spirit of truth. The pneuma aletia. He will guide you into all truth. Actually the original is. He will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So yesterday we began to look at some very fundamentals that are critical and vital to our growth and our, you know, our ability to effectively communicate the truths of the gospel. That there is a foundation that has already been laid. There is a foundation that has already been laid. Nobody's laying the foundation anymore. So we saw yesterday that there are foundational apostles and there are non-foundational apostles. But brother Paul now says, let every man take heed how he builds upon that foundation. And we said that, that nothing can be built on Christ other than Christ. We saw yesterday in Colossians, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, therefore also walk in him the same way you receive him. 
So Paul said, be careful how you build upon this foundation. Because every man's works shall be tested by fire. For the fire shall prove it. And if any man's works born, he shall suffer loss. See that? So it's important to be very careful. Especially when it comes to the work of ministry. And when it comes to the things that we are laboring over. Especially all of us here that are involved in raising disciples. Involved in preaching the gospel. Every one of you a minister of the gospel in this ministry. And all over the world. We must stay true to the fidelity of the gospel. We must stay true to the sacredness of the book. Times do not change the truth of the gospel. Remember I said to you that the Bible can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. There is consistency of theology. What God intended to say from the beginning of time, even before time began, that's what God is saying now. That's what God will be saying till eternity. Because God does not change. His word is consistent and his word is consistently constant. Can I have a good amen? Now, I want to quickly examine something this evening. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people ask, but Brother Paul said we know in part. We know in part. What did Brother Paul mean by we know in part? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 9. Because it's important we clarify that Brother Paul's theology was the full truth. It's important we clarify that the teaching of Paul is epignosis. And that is by ensuring that certain things he said are properly explained. So that nobody hits you, you know, takes you off balance by saying, but if you say Paul's teachings are epignosis, accurate, precise, revealed knowledge of the scriptures, why did he say we know in part? And you know, the other day we also dealt with where Brother Paul also spoke about, you know, um, spoke about things that has to do with in part. And we took time to do a lot of exegesis on that. And this is another one that we need to look at tonight. First Corinthians 13 verse 9. First, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. I remember a bishop who read one of my books in this country. One of the bishops. He read my books and then he called me on phone. Dr. Abel, what do you mean? What do you mean? How are you speaking with such authority and finality? You should leave room for flexibility. Because we all know in part. <laughs> because I said a believer cannot lose his salvation. So he's not challenging that position by quoting we know in part. I said, sir, how do you read? How do you read? Because Jesus would say, take heed how you read. How do you read? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Haven't you read as simple as that is? But have everlasting life. He that believeth not is condemned already. He that believes is not condemned, shall not come to condemnation, has passed from death to life, has been delivered from wrath. He's listening to me. And then I, I, I think he was thrown off balance because he didn't think I was going to come that strong. He thought maybe I was going to say, oh, really, I never thought of it. Then I said, when you read that, we know in part. Did you read the pretext and the post-text to see what Paul was saying? Then I said to him, Phone is not the right medium to discuss doctrine. If you're really serious about clar clarifying that, let's meet somewhere and we can do a Bible study together. You know, it's better to do Bible study with some people. They say, even Paul said he knew in part and prophesied in part. Now, assuming Paul knew in part, you know that you're not part of that part. If he says we know in part, it means you're not part of that part. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Okay. That's on the light side. Now let's examine it. Remember, he has already said, I have laid the foundation full and final, fixed. He didn't say we are still laying the foundation. So how do we solve this? Actually, most times the problems with Bible study and teaching are the chapters. 
and most times verses most times punctuation because chapters verses and punctuations are bible interpreters somebody interpreted them for us and sometimes if you observe the way they did the chapters and verses some verses shouldn't end where they ended some chapters shouldn't begin where they began all right so we have the flexibility to be able to look at it again and make those adjustments and sometimes you find that there are what we call a syntax problem like you know punctuations and grammar and we've got to do word studies to come to an understanding of what was in the mind of the author when he said the things he said so in chapter 12 he talks about the things of the spirit we're going to address the things he said before and we're going to address the things he said after and we will see that we just missed out a fundamental principle of bible study if we just stay with we know in part so now let's get to first corinthians chapter 12 verse 31 first corinthians chapter 12 verse 31 but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show i unto you a more excellent way observe what he said covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show i unto you a more excellent way now the word he uses here is the word hyperbole in the greek hyperbole h-u-p-e-r-b-o-l-e hyperbole and that word you will see it used in second corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 second corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 for we will not brethren have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life that is a hyperbole he describes something else or the use of something in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 look at the way it describes your use of something but we have this treasure in 18 vessels that the excellency of the power may be of us and may be of god and not of us again it describes the power and then in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 verse 17 2 Corinthians 4 17 for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory all right so it describes the power Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Lots of scriptures, good for you. That's how we build doctrine. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So it refers to an action of something. That word hyperbole is from the word hyperballon. By now you should be used to hyperballon. Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 10. You can read at home. Second Corinthians 13 10. Second Corinthians 9 14 for further study. Put up for me Ephesians 1 19. Hyperballon. Hyperballon. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of his mighty power Hugh Pabalon, that is the use of his power was exceedingly great the word hyperballon means to throw beyond target that is when you threw it the energy was too much instead of hitting target it went beyond to, to exceed all right then look at Ephesians 2, 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So it is used for his kindness, exceeding kindness. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. And to know the love of Christ 
which passeth knowledge, exceeded knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now look at 1 Corinthians 12, 31 again. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. The word way there is the word for route. R-O-U-T-E. A route is the Greek word hodos. H-O-D-O-S. Hodos. A more excellent route or a more excellent journey. A more excellent route a more excellent way, a more excellent route, a more excellent journey, hodos, to what? Journey to what? Don't separate it from what he says. He says, covet the best gift. Then he says, I show you a more excellent way of going about it. Of going about it. He's not comparing the excellent way with the gift. He is talking about the use of the gift. The way to go, a more excellent way to go about the use of the gift. So let's quickly go to chapter 14. Then we will come back to chapter 13 where the lacuna is. So you see the way we are contextually looking at chapters. Because in Bible teaching and Bible study, sometimes you have to read the preceding chapters, not even verse before and verse after. Sometimes you have to read four or five chapters before arriving at the chapter where the issue is. Read another five chapters after. Then come back to the chapter where it is to be able to bring out what he, because the later was one later. The later is one later. It's like I write you a later. Dear Dr. Gabriel, and I write and write five pages. Then Dr. Gabriel picks the letters and go, later without reading and goes to page four of the letter and reads a paragraph. He won't understand what I'm saying. He is supposed to read from there and then I begin to build the thought of my communication and the thought will be graduating until it crescendos. But if he just jumps to chapter page four, he will be confused about what I'm talking about. And that's why many people are confused about the Bible because the book of Romans is one later. Forget the chapters, forget the verses, it's just one later. So if you really want to read Romans, you start from chapter one, verse one. Then you read and graduate into what brother Paul was saying to the church in Rome. The, the letter to Corinth, both first and second Corinthians is one later. One later. You don't just pick a verse and run away. That's immorality. That's Bible immorality. You're supposed to read. Read clearly and pay attention to what you read. So let's go to chapter 14 in order to deal with an issue in chapter 13. We've done chapter 12, chapter 14. Now he uses the term edification. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 3. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification, which is exhortation and comfort. To edification, the word okoidomio. You remember? Okoidomio. Edify. Look at verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 5. I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Edify, okodomio, that's to build. Look at verse 12 of the same context. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Then look at verse 26 of the same chapter or the same context. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. 
This is a term brother Paul uses a lot of times to the coin. He uses it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord had given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 10. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 10. Therefore I write these things being absent. Lest being present I should use sharpness. According to the power which the Lord had given me to edification. And not to destruction. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12. I'm sure you're conversant with that one. Ephesians 4 12. For the perfecting of the saints. In view of the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this edification Paul is talking about. Is it the foundation of the church or the strengthening and emboldening? Correct. To continue in what has already been done. Is that right? Ephesians 4.16. Ephesians Chapter 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Verse 29 of the same context. Verse 29. Let him that stole 29, not 28. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, 1 Corinthians 14.20. 1 Corinthians 14.20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it? In malice be ye children. But in understanding, be men. The instruction in the midst of all that he said is, don't be a nepios. Don't be a nepios. N-E-P-I-O-U-S. Nepios. That is somebody wearing napkin or pampas. Don't be a nepios. Or the Greek word, nepiazo. Nepiazo, N-E-P-I-A-Z-O, Nepiazo. Be not children in your understanding. However, he says, in evil be children, but be men in understanding. Nepios, a word he used in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. He used that same word, Nepios. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren... And if you have been following my teachings already, you know that this sets the tone as to how he spoke to the church in Corinth. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto nepios in Christ. So that means all he will be writing to the church in Corinth will be a letter addressing childishness because he's writing to them as unto carnal, as unto babes, because they are not spiritual. Are we following here? Now, babes in Christ. Why? Why did he say they were babes in Christ? Because they were walking in the flesh. How do we know they were walking in the flesh? In that church, there was strife. There was envy. There was jealousy and competition among the brethren. Those are exhibits or symptoms of spiritual immaturity. Envy, competition, jealousy. Let me add one more, gossip. They are all symptoms of nepiosis. When you are in nepios, that is when you are eating and you refuse to grow because you are diseased. Or when you are not eating at all. Two things are responsible for lack of spiritual growth. 
One, you are not eating. Two, you are eating, but you are not able to use the food because you are sick. It's one of the two. It's one of the two. Are we together here? It's one of the two. You know, um, two things make a woman not reproduce children, not to be pregnant. Number one, she's not developed. A lady that is not developed cannot be pregnant. Number two, she is developed but has a disease in her reproductive system. It's one of the two. Otherwise, under normal circumstances, a woman who is married should produce children. Same thing with people in church. When you are not producing, you are not bearing fruit. You don't have disciples. You are not raising disciples. You are not involved in evangelism. It's one of the two. It's either you are underdeveloped or you are diseased. Otherwise, under normal circumstances, you should be producing children all over the place and raising them up in the knowledge of Christ. Are we together? So, Brother Paul was writing to the church at Corinth and he says to them, they are babes because they were walking in the flesh. There was strife, envy, jealousy, gossip. In other words, they were not walking in love. Their love walk had a problem. They didn't walk in love where dispute is concerned. They didn't walk in love where food and sharing food is concerned. They didn't walk in love in the way they treated knowledge in that church. So he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1, look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge perfect up, but charity edify it. Knowledge perfect up. But proper knowledge is, if you really are growing in knowledge, it produces in you a love walk. But if it's just pomposity of pronouncing Greek and Hebrew words, ruach, pneuma, apodexis, pneuma, aletia, you are just being immature. It means the knowledge is not benefiting, so you're not really growing. Because the proof of growth in knowledge is reflected in a love walk. Suddenly bitterness goes, envy goes, childish tantrums disappear, gossip, backbiting, competing, all those, they disappear. Now you're walking in love, you're able to tolerate more, you're, you're not selfish, you're able to think about other people's welfare more than yourself. You are now concerned about people going to hell and you are doing something about their state. You look in the church, you see a brother that is not growing, you pull him close, you set him on a spiritual growth program that you supervise. You are not concerned about how things are happening in church because you are now growing and the proof of growth in knowledge is that there is an effective love war. It's not for grammatical display and, uh, and knowledge of acrobatics. No, it is supposed to reflect because true knowledge will edify. False knowledge will puff up. So look at it. Paul now says to them, knowledge perfect up, but charity edify it. Charity will build. Am I communicating? Please stay with me. So you should have read all that before you got to chapter 14. He says, if you speak with tongues, you embolden and you build up yourself. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Oikodomio. You build yourself when you speak in tongues, you embolden yourself when you speak in tongues. So he said, all that in your understanding, be men. Don't be children. Your understanding of what is he referring to in this context? Your understanding of the gifts of the spirit. Because the subject matter, both in chapter 12, 13, and 14, is the use of the gifts of the spirit. Now, so go to chapter 13. But before then, 
Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. Remember that the last chapter, where, I mean, the, the last chapter where we were walking on, where we saw the word hodos, it says, I show you a more excellent way. Question. A more excellent way of what? A more excellent way of the gifts of the spirit. A more excellent way because the subject matter is the gift of the spirit. Then he throws in a poetic illustration. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. What do you mean by I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? It's basically a figure of speech. There is no tongues of angels. There is no tongues of angels. There is nowhere angels ever appeared to anybody and spoke in tongues and there was need for interpretation. Every time angels appeared, they spoke in the language of the person because angels don't have tongues. It's just a figure of speech. It's a mode of communication. Somebody was preaching with all his strength. There are tongues of men and there are tongues of angels. You know, sometimes you can speak in tongues of angels and sometimes you can speak in tongues of men. In my mind, I was saying, calm down. Be calming down. Be calming down. Because there's no tongues of angels. It's just a figure of speech. That's why that statement has no corroboration or any explanation anywhere by any other person, even including Paul. Because he was just trying to explain something and he had to bring in all kinds of figures because of the maturity of the church he was writing to. Am I communicating at all? Now, so, he uses the word... I become a tinkling symbol. I become, look at that 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. Put it up. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. That word tinkling symbol is the word for noisy. Noisy. I am just making noise. What is a noise? A noise is something that doesn't benefit anybody. A noise is something that doesn't benefit anybody. It says, I speak in tongues and I have no love. I am only making noise. That I am speaking in flowery tongues very flowery tongues yet i'm just making noise because it's not reflected in my love work in verse 2 he now uses something he uses prophecy and knowledge together put it up and though i have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge he combines it to prophecy and knowledge and though i have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So he uses prophecy and knowledge together. The word oido, that is I appreciate facts. Then he uses mysterion, mysteries. Then he says, I have all knowledge. And though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, Yet I have no love. He says it profits me nothing. Ophelio in the Greek. O-P-H-E-L-E-O. Ophelio. It means it helps no one. It profits me nothing. It helps no one. Ophelio. It means that it is not for anybody. Because love must be about the other person. Love must be about the other person. So he says it doesn't help anyone. Your tongues, your prophecy, your moving of mountain, 
all the knowledge you have acquired in this world, it profits nobody. It helps nobody. Then look at the next thing he says in verse 3. Pay attention. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have no charity, it profited me nothing. Did you observe that my goods to feed the poor, to feed the poor, is italicized? Huh? You see it in your Bibles? To feed the poor. This one on the screen, they didn't observe all of that. But in your personal Bibles, you will know where there is italics on a word. To feed the poor is italicized in your Bible. That means it is not in the original. So actually the way that verse should read is, Though I bestow all my goods to feed, not to feed the poor. Feed the poor was added by translation, it's not in the original. So, though I bestow all my goods to feed. He didn't say the poor because the poor isn't there. Because the next statement is exactly what the rich fool did. You know the rich fool? And though I give my body to be burnt, body there is the word soma. It's not body. I give my person, my soma, used for self. So it appears like what we were saying there was, kill me, kill me, I feed the poor, and I have no love. But that's not what he's saying there. So far, if you observe, what this guy, who has, who has all this qualification, is saying is not to anybody. I have knowledge. I have faith to move mountains. Not for anybody's benefit. I'm not concerned about others. Then he said, I feed. I give my body to be burned. The word born there is the Greek word, kochomio. Kochomio. That is K A U C H A M A I. Kochomio. I discovered that the old King James English, you know, they didn't help us there. They use an old word. It means to boast. To boast. I give my body to be burnt. It actually means to boast. That is, I am full. I have food for myself. And then I boast about it. That's actually what it means. I have food I am full and I boast about it. You know, that's what he calls it in chapter 11. Kauchomio. I am boasting about it. Let's see where it is used. 1 Corinthians 1.29 1 That no flesh should glory is the word glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 3.1 1 Corinthians, the use of that word. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes in Christ. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, boast in men, for all things are yours. You see, are you, what, are you observing what, what I'm doing here? The word glory is not glory even though it's glory. Are you observing? Because now once you see glory, you will think the glory of God. But glory in this context is boasting. It's boasting. So that's why the Bible is not an English book. It has its own language. So in Bible teaching, you must be coming down to not use English dictionary to define Bible words. Because then you will abuse scripture. All right? Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who make it thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? Why do you boast? 
as if thou hast not received it. Why do you glory? So he's talking about boasting about your possession. If I feed, that is, I have food for myself, and then I boast. I have food for myself to boast like the rich fool. Remember the rich fool say, I have put enough food in the storehouse. I have enough to eat my soul. Relax and enjoy. He didn't even care about the poor. The Bible says, God said to him, you fool, today your soul is required of you. And he says, so is he that is rich to himself, but is not rich towards God. How are you rich towards God? By rich towards God's people. Because when you do it for God's people, you do it for God. This man was selfish. He was self-centered. My soul, you have more than enough. You can eat 50 square meal a day. My soul, enjoy. God said, fool, today your soul is required of you. That's the parable Jesus gave. Now, so that's exactly what the rich fool did. I have food I have knowledge, I have faith, all for myself. And there were those like that in Corinth who had enough and others didn't have. And he said, I don't help anybody, just for myself. He said in verse 2, I am nothing. Look at that First Corinthians 13 verse 2. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. And it is not used to benefit others. No charity. It's not benefiting anybody. I'm using it for my boasting. I am nothing. I am nothing. Meaning, I am no one. The Greek word oidios in the Greek. O-U-D-E-I-S. I am no one. I am nothing. With knowledge, faith, prophecy, and no love. That means you store it in your heart. You know the teaching. You know the flow. But it's not for anybody. He says, in the body of Christ... You are nothing. In the body of Christ, you are nothing. You are no one. If you have money, you are wealthy, and you eat, and it's about boasting, it says, it profits no one without love. So if you like claim that you own the world, if you like brag about the limousine you bought, he says, it profits no one, Ophelio. It's until it becomes a blessing to someone. Then we will say it has profited the body of Christ. So why waste our time in the name of those churches where they give testimony? Waste our 20, 30 minutes bragging about a car you bought which you never used to carry members living around your environment to church. Why are you wasting our time? Telling us of a contract you got that nobody will benefit from. Telling about us about an appointment they just gave you in government. And we know you are a selfish person. Even members of your immediate family, the impact will not be seen on them. So why do we give them time in the church? I'm not talking about this church. You know that that kind of thing cannot fly in this place. Why do they give them time in churches to waste people's time? Of course, well, I don't blame them. It is a reflection of the kind of gospel they are preaching. Who cares whether in this church if you come with 30 cars, nobody will look. Everybody is facing Jesus. It is only you and you and the cockroaches and rats around the ground that you match when you are passing that knows you bought cars. Nobody is interested. Who cares? Who cares? You get a contract of 100 billion, we will not change your sitting position. When you come, what shall we still carry you to where you're sitting? You know that, right? I hope you know that. Yeah, I'm Paul is saying if you have all of that and it benefits nobody, 
You are no one. You are nothing. Am I teaching here? You are no one. You are nothing. Now, then he begins to talk about the love of God in verse 8 of that chapter 13. 13 verse 8. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, what does he mean by love doesn't fail? The word fail there is it doesn't fall under. It doesn't fall under. He has taught love with knowledge. Food offered to idols in chapter 8. You have knowledge and food offered to idols. Use it for the benefit of someone. He said, I will not eat food offered to idols, even though I know that there are no idols. I will not eat it for the weak brother. See? So, in my knowledge, I am considerate of others. So, my knowledge translates to love. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. Now, he has taught love. Take it that you are wrong. People offend you. Take it that you are wrong. Let it go. Did you observe the way Jesus taught about forgiveness? He said, if a brother offends you, you that is offended, go to him. <laughs> he didn't say, you that offended me, come to me. No, it is the person offended that goes to the brother to seek for reconciliation. Because it was God we sinned against and God came to us to reconcile us. That's the character of your father. He did it and he is not even remorseful. He has not even apologized. You go and apologize. Because that's the way God functions. It is counterculture, but you are in this world. You are not of this world. Your citizenship is in heaven. You operate heaven standard. You are born of God. You are born of the spirit. You walk in the spirit. You live in the spirit. You go to the person. You go to the person. Am I teaching? Now, he has taught love and food amongst believers. He said, you know what? Wait for those that don't have. When you come together to eat, you that have food at home, sacrifice your own. Look around for brethren whose only source of survival that day was that collective eating. Make sure they eat. That is knowledge with love. Now he's saying, love with the gifts of the spirit. So he has dealt with rift. He has dealt with misunderstanding. He has dealt with food. Now he's dealing with the gifts of the spirit to the same church that are children, helping them to mature. And love with the gifts of the spirit does not fail. That's what he means. Love with the gifts of the spirit never fails. So now listen. Whether prophecies, Prophecies without love, they shall fail. The word they shall fail, dear, is the word katageo. Katageo, K-A-T-A-G-E-O. That is, they shall fail means prophecy without love has no effect. Prophecy without love has no effect. He had mentioned in verse 2 that it will profit nothing. You have the gift of prophecy, but it's not for the church. It's not for others. Then your prophecy is useless because prophecy is supposed to edify us, but you are holding it to yourself. You are not benefiting us. So your prophecy has failed. That is, it has not achieved its purpose of edifying the church. Are we understanding? Look at verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 13. For we know that is the lacuna, right? Eh? That's what took us through all this journey, right? For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
Tongues without love, it will fail. The word pano, that means it is hindered. Tongues without love is hindered. Which he explains later, that tongues without interpretation for edification is hindered. You have not used the tongues well in church. Because you use it well in church when you interpret it for us to be edified. Then he says, if there's knowledge which he uses with prophecy, it shall vanish away. It's the same word, katagio. It shall vanish. Katagio. It shall be of no effect. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, remember he says, Knowledge without love puffs up. It is love that edifies. Then in verse 7, 8, and 9, he now says, Don't use your liberty to cause someone to sin. In that 1 Corinthians 8, 7, 8, and 9, don't use your liberty. It is still a love walk. You're considering other people. In that first Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 to 9, there's a word he uses there. Okay, let me read it so that you just follow. Happy, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commended us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better. Neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take it. Lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. It's the Greek word proskopto. To cause someone to stumble. P-R-O-S. Pros. Kopto, K-O-P-T-O. To cause someone to stumble. Interestingly, you know, he uses that same phrase in Romans 14 for, for that study. Romans 14, 13, and 20. Romans 14, 13, and 20. At your conduct. So Paul now has said in 1 Corinthians 8 about love. Considering others... Before he now got to chapter 14. So when he now says prophecy shall fail. That is the gift of prophecy without ministering to others has failed. Are you understanding? The gift of prophecy that is not ministering to anybody has failed. Because the intent for prophecy is to edify. Knowledge without love is useless. And then he says, when there's knowledge without love, prophecy without love, we know in part. When there's knowledge without love, prophecy without love, we know in part. What do you mean we know? Ginoskomeros. Ginosko, G I N O S K O M E R O S. Ginoskomeros. We know in part. That we know in part is knowledge without love. We know in part. Then we prophesy in part. What will it mean? Huh? Prophecy without love. Because he has already spoken about prophecy in 1 Corinthians 11.4. A woman that prophesies. So he is not putting prophecy down. He is not speaking low on prophecy. Because in 1 Corinthians 11.5, put it up, 1 Corinthians 11.5, he says... But every woman that prayed or prophesied, so he is for prophecy. First Corinthians 4 1, 
First Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Let a man, sorry, 14 verse 1. First Corinthians 14 verse 1. Follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So he's not putting prophecy down. But prophecy is useless if it is not benefiting anybody. So, we don't stop prophesying. 1 Corinthians 14.3 He says prophecy edifies the church. Edifies the church. 1 Corinthians 14.5 He says prophecy edifies the church. 1 Corinthians 14.24 1424. But if all prophesy, so he wants us to prophesy, and there come in one that believe not or unlearn. He is convinced of all, and he is judged. So he wants us to prophesy. In 1 Corinthians 1439, covet to prophesy. Covet to prophesy. And forbid not to speak with tongues. He's not speaking low on them. So he wasn't asking you to stop. He wasn't comparing prophecy. He was telling you how to use the gifts of the spirit to bless the church. Are you understanding? If you have the gifts of the spirit and it's not blessing the church, he says, you are prophesying in part. <laughs> you are prophesying. That is, your gift is a partial gift. It is not full. Because the fullness of the gift is when it blesses others. So when it is not achieving its intent, even though the gift is there, you are prophesying in part. You know in part. I'm teaching good tonight. So if you have knowledge that is not blessing the church, you don't care what happens to others. He says, you know in part. Part is a way of saying you are a babe. <laughs> Brother Paul's verbiage. Part is a way of saying you are a babe because it is the exact opposite of teleo, perfect and mature. So what Paul is describing there is immaturity. 1 Corinthians 3.10 1 Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace Sorry, 2 Corinthians 3.10 For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. Sorry, 13.10 1 Corinthians 13.10 Okay. Therefore, I write these things being absent. Let's be present. I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord has given to me for edification and not for destruction. For what? So the power is to be used for what? Edification and not for destruction. So all of the gifts of the spirit and all of the operation of ministry, the end result of it should be to edify, to be a blessing to somebody else. To be a blessing to somebody else. First Corinthians chapter 13 verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, Huh? Let's start from nine. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Next verse. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So tongues without love, prophecy without love, Knowledge without love is in part meros. Because ministry is from charis. is from benevolence, favor, kindness. 
It cannot be done in the flesh. So he was talking to a church where they were fighting one another over ministry gifts. And he said, all those gifts are yours. You don't need to fight whether you're for Apollos or for Paul. All of them are yours. They were taking themselves to court. He says, can't you judge among yourselves? Don't you know that you shall judge the world? Then people who ate food offered to idols and don't care what happens to other persons. He said, knowledge without love makes you nothing. Then 1 Corinthians 10, the same thing. Don't let someone be wounded by what you are doing because you have knowledge that he doesn't have. Then 1 Corinthians 11, they will come together and then they said they are coming to eat the, Lord, the, the supper. Then he says, you are eating is not for better but for worse. For those who have, don't give to those who don't have. Can't you remember what Jesus said when he said, this is my body equally broken for you. This is my blood of the New Testament equally given to all of you. So if your supper is in the name of the Lord, it should be shared the way his body was shared. And because people don't understand that, they turn it to a communion service. But Paul was just using the broken body and the blood to teach love and equality among the brethren. Then in chapter 12, now concerning things of the spirit, because they already had the gift, they know about it. He now wants to talk about love and the gift, how they should grow up in the things of the spirit. You mustn't lose that narrative. Don't pick 13 out of all he has been saying. Then he now says, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10. Put it up again. Are you learning? But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What's perfect? Mature. Teleo. An adjective for maturity. Or what is perfect in the Greek, the word whole. What happens to or is used for experience. When the mature happens, when the mature happens, remember in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, he says, be men, grow up, be men. When that which is mature comes, he says, that which is in part, Will be what? Done away. What is in part? Prophesying without love. Knowledge without love. Tongues without love. So what is Paul teaching there? Spiritual growth. If you are prophesying and you have knowledge without love, when maturity comes, prophesying alone will be done away. It will now be prophesying to benefit. That's what Paul is teaching. That's what Paul is teaching. When I was a child, when I was a Nepios, I understood as a child, I will eat food offered to idols. I didn't care what impact it had on others. You know, one time a friend of mine came to this church years, many years ago. Some of you remember. The level to which we taught grace in that service was so radical that veils fall, fell off. He got so excited. He went to my office and carried a cap and wore the cap and came to preach with the cap. And didn't care what happened to anybody. And the criticisms were so much that night. People are like, does he have to wear a cap? Why is he wearing a cap? We know that there is liberty, but why is he wearing a cap in the church? And all kinds of talks. Now, that is knowledge without love. So instead of it edifying, it became an offense. Are we teaching here? Yeah. I said, are we teaching here? And he himself, he was sweating under the cap. So he was punished while punishing others. 
Me, if you like, eh? Wear hijab. You know hijab. The house are clothed that they cover only their eyes outside. Wear it and preach. I will be blessed. I don't have a problem. <laughs> but when you walk in love, you consider others who have not grown to that level of maturity. That doesn't also mean you compromise God's standard. See? But you consider them in things that are natural, in things that do not cause offense to the doctrine of Christ. I'm teaching good. I said I'm teaching good. He said, I taught as a child. I spoke, meaning prophesy as a child. But when I became a man, remember, in your understanding, be men. When I grow up, what did I do? I put away, the same word, kategio. I did away with childish things. That is, I no longer know in part. I no longer prophesy in part. I no longer tongue in part. I put away childish things. Then it says in verse 12, very tricky, verse 12 of that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, very tricky verse. Put it up for me quickly. But now we see through a glass darkly. Very tricky verse. But then face to face. Now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. He goes straight to Numbers chapter 12. That's where Paul went to, to bring this verse out. And then he picks this teaching from the Old Testament. He is quoting from Numbers 12, 7. That verse 12. Numbers, put it up for me. Numbers chapter 12, verse 7. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all my house? Next verse. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. Even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? That word mouth to mouth is the same Hebrew word for face to face. Same word. So when Paul said in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 13, go back. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. The word darkly is the word chida in the Hebrew. Chida, C-H-I-D-A-H. It's used for riddles, obscure, obscure sayings. A Greek word, enigma, A-I-N-G-M-A. Same word, you know, uh, dark speeches. So Paul now is talking to Miriam and Aaron. To Moses, he says, it is face to face, mouth to mouth. The word pay in the Hebrew, P-E-H, and in the Greek, prospone. He is quoting from the Old Testament. Not in dark speeches. In other words, he's saying, I speak to you, Miriam and Aaron, as babes. But I speak to Moses as a matured person. He said, Miran and Aaron, you prophesy like babes. But Moses prophesies like a matured person. So Paul now goes to the Old Testament. You know he's Sophia, he's inside. He uses Miriam and Aaron who were prophets and then Moses as a distinction. Nepios, maturity, because that's the subject of discourse. But when you grow, you talk like Moses. When you are a child, you talk like Aaron and Miriam, who were selfish. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 again. Are you following? Uh, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part again, 
but then shall I know even as I also I am known. I know in part, meaning I know as a babe, but then when he says, now I know in part, he is talking as a babe. Now I know in part, he is referring to when he was a child. Ginosko. But when he says, then, the word then is not future. In fact, the word then many times speaks about the past. You will see the use of that word then in Matthew 2, 7 which is past. So then is describing two events. When I was a babe, I spake as a babe. But then another time, another event, I know even I, as I am also known, the word epigenosco, I know even as I am also known, that is, I fully comprehend what I should know. Paul is saying, love in ministry shows that you are matured. Love in ministry shows that you are matured. He makes that distinction. Then look at verse 13 now. Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. And now abided faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Pistis, elpis, agape. Pistis, elpis, agape. The greatest. Now listen carefully. All of them are equal. But the widest expression of the spiritual life. The widest expression of the spiritual life is love. That is megas and agape. Megas, the widest expression. Then look at chapter 14 verse 1, a continuation of the later. First Corinthians 14 verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather... That you may prophesy. Follow is the word the diako. Diako. D I O K O. It means practice love. Follow after. Practice love. That is practice love as a lifestyle in the gifts of the Spirit. Practice love as a lifestyle. In the gifts of the spirit. How many of you know that if you don't love people, you will not go for evangelism? How many of you know that? How many of you know that if you don't love people, you will not raise disciples? Because the reason why you go out of your way, take out your precious time, take out your energy to go to people is because you are moved by love. So every child of God that is not involved in evangelism and raising disciples is selfish. It's a nepios. It's a babe. You're not growing. You are a waster of grace. We are teaching you like we will die on top of you and it is not showing. It's like a baby eating five plates of amala every day and the baby has not stopped crawling. What a waste. What a waste. After these 40 days, if I catch you not raising disciples, I'm telling you, I will lock you up in my office for personal deliverance. I will deliver you myself. You will roll on the floor. You will roll on the floor. I will pour water and ask you to roll till the water dries. What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? How can I be teaching you all this and you, you are not going to go for evangelism? The proof that you've been with me on the mountain for 40 days is that you return in power. And then you go out. Power is not for your bedroom. Power is for the streets. There are men waiting to be delivered. Right now you're not feeling anything because light does not shine in light. Light does not shine inside light. It is when you leave this light and carry your light and enter darkness. Then you will know how much flood light you are carrying. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. Light only shines in darkness. Go into the world. Jesus returned in power and he went everywhere. 
The devil tempted him overcame. He went everywhere preaching. Glory to God. Say with me, I'm on a mission. Oh, that is not a worship voice. I'm on a mission. Preach the gospel. Raise disciples. Raise men. Shine the light. Shake nations. Shake my community. The devil is in trouble because of me. I didn't hear your amen like thunder. Yeah. The proof of maturity is that you walk in love. And the proof of love is that you care about others. Practice love as a lifestyle. In the gifts, look, when you love people, the gifts of the spirit will flow. Because compassion will cause the gifts of the spirit to flow. The gifts of the spirit flow when you're compassionate. When there's compassion, God's power finds expression. Compassion. You will hear the phase two on Sunday. I'll tell you what phase two of this will be. On Sunday. Sunday will be brutal. Because that will be the beginning of another series. Shatabala. And the assignment will be clearly announced. Those of you that prayed, you didn't hear God. You will hear, I will tell you what God is saying on Sunday. <laughs> Me, I have heard. I have heard God very clearly. I know the program. I know the agenda. I will announce it to you on Sunday. And those of you who heard, the moment I announce it, your spirit will confirm it. Because it's one spirit. See, I hear you. Those who didn't hear, don't worry, we have you covered. <laughs> we have heard on your behalf. I've been on the mountaintop. I've seen the glory of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, so when you come together, observe those who don't speak with tongues, who are not saved, who don't know the gifts of the spirit, then you minister to them. That's the essence. You look for the weak. You reach out to them and strengthen them with the gift of God. I believe that chapter 13 should have ended with chapter 14. I believe that because, you know, uh, follow after love should be a part of chapter 13. Look at it. Put that chapter 13, last verse. Chapter 1 Corinthians 13, the last verse, brother. And now abided faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of this is charity. Chapter 14 now. Follow after charity. Full stop. Then chapter 14 should have started. Desire spiritual gifts. But rather that you may prophesy. So that's why in Bible reading. We read in paragraphs. Not in, verse, not in verses. In paragraphs. Because that's how you get the whole thought. Am I communicating at all? Follow after love. Full stop. So since you know what it means to prophesy. What it means to have natural food with love. What it means to consider others who have the consciousness of an idol. Now it's time that you speak with tongues so that it edifies you. I know you speak to God, but if you don't prophesy, you don't interpret it. It profits nobody. So in the midst of the church, you can eat your food in your house. But when you eat your food in your house, don't come publicly and tell us. You know I have never lacked food in my life before. I eat five square meal a day instead of three because they are too much. The evidence is on my body. I have shoes. I don't know where to keep them. Some of them have even started, started spoiling. God is good to me. I have too much money in the bank that I borrowed the bank the money. God is good to me. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Meanwhile, in that church, there are people that have not eaten. There are people that don't have transport. They trek to service. There are people that are not well because they don't have little money to buy Panadol. Look at you. Look at you. Look at you. You profit nothing. You are nothing. In fact, you are not recognized. In fact, <laughs> it is if you had brought that money and said, because it is too much, I want us to share. I want us to share. Uh -huh. That is when we can give you microphone. You know, 
I bought a car, but when I was buying it, Papa, I bought 25 new cars. There are brethren that work hard in the church. I want them to be blessed. I will give you 15 minutes of the service. You alone. You alone. So that you can take time to hand over the cars. Glory to God. I'm teaching good here. Don't take our precious time to make yourself more important than you ought to. Since you are eating all alone, keep eating. Keep eating. Keep eating nepiously. <laughs> Glory to God. Until that food you eat that never lacks becomes a blessing to others. That's when you are matured. So Paul is saying, rather than be selfish in the church, don't you have houses? Rather than be showing off in the church, don't you have houses? You can pray in tongues in your house alone. I'm praying the Holy Ghost. Stop minding who is there. It's your house. But when you come to church, you must consider others or else you're doing it in part. Glory to God. Glory to God. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I taught like a child. But now I'm grown up. I put away childish ways. How many of you believe that growth has happened here this month? How many of you believe that growth has happened here? Say with me, I am responsible for other people's spiritual growth. I'm not selfish. I care about the brethren. I love the brethren. I'm interested in the brethren. Therefore, I am focused in helping the development of the brethren, the kingdom of God. And I reach out to the lost. The love of God is in my heart. The way God loves the world, died for the world, paid for the world. I also love the world. The death of Jesus will not be wasted on souls. I'm hitting the streets to get souls saved. Stand on your feet tonight. That's how we wrap up in Christ season, th season three. Hallelujah. Ain't you blessed tonight? We ended it up with a love walk. It's time to walk in love. Time to care for the kingdom. Care for the people of God. Time to hit the streets. There are people perishing and languishing there. It's time to hit social media space and start building a community for yourself that you would disciple and raise. It's time to start dragging people in and helping people to come to the knowledge of Christ. Somebody say, I am committed to the gospel, to the development of the kingdom of God on the earth. Tell so me I'm not selfish. And in the name of Jesus, I have all I require to be an able minister, to be effective in the assignment of evangelism. I didn't hear a good amen. Lift your hands. Let's thank God for these 40 days of being together in the world. Let's thank God for 40 days of light, 40 days of strength, 40 days of revelation, 40 days of growth, 40 days of maturity, 40 days of preparation for work, 40 days of consecration, 40 days of impact. Open your mouth. I'm not hearing your voices. Lift your hands and go ahead giving him praise. Giving him thanks for everything. Lifting his hands. Oh, the boss of Paula Bagata Telea, 
Ianda danda tapalaga ranta kesasia niapo shod ereba tanga tonga sohoda ayaba temba dia pende so esika tatala da apala domo so pianda bregeda eya tanta tala dansanda asambia tapale asambia tapale kependo etolo osaka atonda e pratanga deha ele pacha tose ele paka tama da kumuria esia patanda rodoske ele patonda barata Kataya, aya bashanta, aya bashanta la bata pa, ereto tonga la pora, ela bosamia tanga, esha tenda la gira ha, empata tanga rata, ela posa mamba radia se, esho ke tonga, esho ke tonga, esho ke tonga, ela tanga tando radoske, amio tonga, maya bada dada daba rata kenga, eswa tapalama, aya mando radosante, ela bosa kito karonda gado, a Pia Paranta Candy, Escatalamba Dabara, Ayala Bando Song, Mia Panda Ratonga Seke, Ayatanta Tela, Russo Tinga Porta, Mando Polo Gatonga Sapali, Ayatamanda Borondi, Ayala Tansiati, Eto Sabaya, Eto Sabaya, Eto Sabaya, Yala Banda Tandi, Esam Palagadamo Sambala, Ayagatendo Robado, Epolonga Tanya Tala, Ayanta. Sapia bra le bosonte ayaga danda bra pakose ayala bando san ayama sanda tei esematolo re bosonde ayaga kalebo asa provesa i walk in love i sub the brave i walk in love i sub the people mata landa lava esapila branda sod rakia patatela ayama si porong esapanda teya Manda pola conta se ayenda tala ipra tan santa ta ayala badomo conto e pia taranga salia e ya pato mantonda lia pasa e rebosi katanda lehia e parata sata ya boshaba teya e ya gadata e ya gadata e ya gadata taramia sapatonga ma pasa ya bosa tonda leto arupiata tosa ma joteloa Mia Pwasa, Aya Tatala, Ele Pota Nadi Atasa, Atela Gabiam Radit, Esho Parong, Asomondo Lotoriaba, Eya Gadatara, Matopora Mahasa, Arabian Tatela, Ipwana Gaso, Eche Paranda, Aliamba Don Sote, Eya Kata, Apurodosa Mampala, Ifratwasa, Matopia Tendalia, Eredadadadaboso, Esoko Tokila, Bia Tosh, Eson Tola, Mia Posa, Nanda Tara Badaya Late, Eri Brata Tano, Eso Bota Pe, Ayaka Mandala, Erota So, Mia Panda Late, Esa Tida Hia, Ayabato Sama, Eloko Sonda, Maya Bandasa, Imparata Pela, Eyagadansa, Mapo Soteki, Eleto Tonga Pora, Mia Proto San, Alaboso Tua, Ipratua Samada, Ayalada Daba Daba Daba, Aruanto Tondo taloto, eroboto sanko toya, iya poso keta, aroto ke mandia, ele temba pi prutosa, ma tontonge da ha, shapeta la, iya potorado, samalata taya, apia tokanga, siaba do tonge, ele te danda la gasa, aya baseta, palabrienta ki, ele toroto hata, beya palada da da da. I walk in love, ya taka masanga, rapa la gade ya ta, ele masapa, o shoda, ma te poroga so, ele pi maranda katala, e ya kanta posa, I am not the sand in basso, ma la penga tora de ya ta, a ya ke mandalava, a loto lobado, not a noise maker, ma lanto riba taya, a ya ke telebatansa, ma pi o tonga so, a ya ke tala, I'm in some place, of the believers, I walk in love, I live in simply love, in love, in charity, in conversation, and tapela bara, hey, itakando, eso porodo, ayalabada, as the scripture says, be the example of the believers, and we love, in purity, in charity, in love, yatamanda, in faith, I am an example.
example of the believers because I walk in love because I walk in virtue and the right spirit I see the need, I fix it up. Sabandaya, 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 Telepia Pra, Sonondo, Hasapia Para, Yagatalama, Ayokoso, Mantotele, Rupiandala, Ayokoson, Arabia Taya, Telendo Rodosa, Bia Puata, Ifuasaqua, Aboto Maganda Dada, Atelendanda Narato, Rabatayata, Atianda Late, Manta de Yagatas, I <laughs> Camila Prana, Esomala, Esapatan, Ariprotosa, Mamba Tata Tata, Yata Tata Tata, Rapasa Pata, Malatayanda, Rapiposo, Equata, Iapatata, Mamedabra, Eta Telando, Esosata, Ibraquasa, Ayagatata, 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 Ayalatapa, Maratakata, Arapatala, Arakatapa, 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 Ayatatala, Elepatama, Eyatanada, and Tualaba, Esapala Baratakema, Elotombaso, Eropia Prata, and Wape Gopo Tondara, Samade Protomo, Ayama Santengalagala, I am a sample of the believers. I walk in love, Matalagada, I serve. The pace, Mantan Delicate, the Riparabada, I prophesy, a Yatatalabada, a Rimatambolo Toga, a Yapalagada, a Samanda, a La Pantata, a Yanda Talabo, a Yakatalabe, I covet to prophesy, I speak in tongue, Yapadona, a Telem Maria, a Songa Taya, a Japiatala, a Yagatandalo, I build up the believers, I build up the believers with what I am. I'm equipped with. I build up the believers. I would what I'm equipped with. Mataya gataya elatarebe. I raise disciple in my sangara. I'm a committed worker. Matalabada. I'm a resourceful worker in every of my department. I'm resourceful in all my department. I'm resourceful in anywhere I find myself. I'm resourceful. Matanda lakeya ripalagada masayada elatarebe. With the knowledge I've received, I. I raise others, I raise others, I raise others, I raise others. Iyalatata, mapatata, ayagatenda, elapuataya, ayapiansan, endondo kato, arabia palim, esetete, alapiansan, ayapasote, duala batende, eruposia, etaladadadadadabarapia. A quasa man barabia, Sabala Barabara, a Lopondo cricket king, a Tuanabada, a Potonda Dosa, a Radabala Bacopo, a Sampola Baria, a Rodobachan, a Yagadabala, a Possan, a Labata Tanga, a Yatata, a Yatata, a Yatata, a La Quacata, Ma Quatata, a Tuala, a Tuala Taba, a Retana, a Potama. Letwata, Satetaki, and La Potonga, Ara Patenda, a Satayata, a La Tuata, Mataya, Eta, Esa, Eta, Eta, Aratata, 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 Atalaba, Bika Pianda, Esa Madaga, Ekalapata, Aripranta, Masapiano, Esa Nano, Esatata, Aratata, 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 
Eratata, Eratata, Alapatama, Esamanaga, Asatalaba, Eracapata, Alapiataya, Samiatata, 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 Ayatanda, Otonda Kera, Samito Pen, Eprata Pataya, Esaparondo, Alecate, Atonga Sotoya, Erapatayada, Amia Quatata, Atambeco Pier, Eratonda, Asatala, Asatala, Reta. That we are not slothful in business, but fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord. That is your prayer. I'm not slothful. I'm not slothful. I'm not slothful. I'm not slothful. But I have fathers. I have fathers. I am fathers and priests. Ella Tayabada, Rapa Lagada, Sabin the Lord, Mayaka Talaba, my services, my Talabada in the kingdom. Yakata, come with fathers. Come with fathers. Come with fathers. My Yeta Pilo Pray, I am Palataka, my service. Come with fathers. Me Katendo Loto. I'm not slothful. I'm not slothful in business, but I'm fervent. Serving the Lord. Tapiko Sumbaria. Tele de Barataya. Aruan Pemposha. Makataya. Sesuzutara. El Tondo Kundaya. Siaprata. Sakatando. And Ongada. Sapaleba. And Otaki. Rabatayata. Asiata. Mame Pepe. Etualadas. Mandaradadadado. O Sopata. Ratatai, 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 Ratat
This is the praise of place. Ah, we keep our focus and our eyes on the ball. We are firm to our calling. Declare that now. My ass is stable. It's fixed on the ball. It's fixed on the ball. My eyes have fixed. Focus. Well focused. Well fixed on the ball. On the ball. No distraction. No shifting. No difference. Rabatayada. My eyes. 
in sweets. Jesus said, if your eyes is single, your body shall be full of light. My eyes is on the ball. I am focused. I have set my face like a fleet. Leanta Pingo, Esse Pulakaya, Harwa Tande, Esse Badayada, Ayala Patema, Engro Tondonda, Asala Batete Ye, Ebia Paraka, Asamanda Te, Etelabansa, Ora Badayada, Ele Betete Te, Ayata Nekete. Be confident of this very thing that who has begun. Jalande Dada, Jalande Dada. Ayatata, a piatanda, that he that began a good work, even the work of salvation is in me to bring it to a finish line. My eyes is focused and we're stable. Ratatatata, a piatata kuma, man kwanzendo, a lubata, a piata, sekadagade, 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 sekadagade. Saga da da da, saga da da da, ala piato kum, manga pato kum, eshe temala, e puroto ka, e saga bata, otemia, 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 puata, e yetanda, a piatanda repo. Push some more. Push some more. Shakatalabada. David say to him that answer the prayer shall all flesh come. Your answers are rolling out. Empata king. Ayada pakata king. Atundurihata. Hey, ababa baba. Hey, ababa baba. Rapi andalaba. Rapi andalaba. Ayata laba. We have found uh, at our duty post. Come on, make that prayer serious. I'm found at my duty post. Uh, we stay firm uh, to our summit. I came at Ayata. I am family and uh, my duty post. Ayata uh, Labada. My duty post. Uh, Hey, Lakata. Hey, Mandayaba. I am Mantalaba. I am present. When duty calls, when duty calls, when responsibility calls, I am sound. I am found. Stable right there. No lacking of anything. Somebody prayed. Atumotonga Palataya. Hey, Itomazia. Glory to God forever. Somebody shout glory. Lift your hands and give him praise. Hey, in the name of Jesus. Can I hear that? Amen. Like thunder. Amen. I tell you, it's happening in this place. Our hearts are set. Our minds are set. Our eyes are set. And our spirits are sold out to this mandate. We get the gospel all over the nations of the earth. We preach this word in and out of season. We are not deterred. We are resilient. We are focused. We are persuaded. We make manifest the fragrance of God's grace in all nations of the earth. In Jesus' name. Can I hear that? Amen. Let thunder. We're going to take a teaching and then we come back to prayer. We're chilling with the big boys. Grab your pen and you can be seated. Shoot it. Let's do it as we go. Praise God examining concerning leadings and perceptions and we've been on this for a bit romans chapter 8 verse number 14 romans chapter 8 verse number 14 for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god we are looking at leadings and perceptions and we have focused 
a lot on prophecies, tongues, and interpretation. And we are focused on the place of the inward witness. An important factor in the epistle is the term, the spirit. If you notice when Jesus was leaving the earth, in John chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, that's the only place in the four gospels or in the scripture where you will see Jesus being very definite about what will come to us or who will come to us upon his resurrection. And so those three chapters particularly focuses on the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost. In John chapter 14 verse 26, John chapter 14 verse number 26. But the Comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. John chapter 15 verse 26. But when the comforter is come whom I will send unto you from the father. Even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the father. He shall testify of me. John chapter 16 from verse 7 to 13. Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So they focused on that you know, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Then in John chapter 17, Jesus said, The same glory you gave me, I have given to them. The same glory you gave me, I have given to them. Of course, when he said the glory that you gave me, he was referring to the Spirit. He was referring to the Spirit. So we have that important element in the epistles. So if we're going to discuss any subject, whether it is conduct or guidance, direction, wisdom, counsel, whatever subject we have to discuss will be in the spirit. In the spirit. Whatever subject, it will be in the spirit. So Romans chapter 8 verse 14 again. For as many as are led by the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Where we said the word ago. Led by the spirit. Ago. A-G-O. Which means to take up. That is he takes responsibility. The spirit takes responsibility. As many as are led or as many as the spirit is responsible for. The spirit takes responsibility. And of which we can identify a number of things. Romans chapter 8 verse number 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The spirit of life in, I am, has set me free. So the freedom in Christ is in the spirit of life. The freedom in Christ 
is in the spirit of life. Then we highlighted a few things in Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Romans 8, 5 and 6. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Next verse. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded. So spirituality is in the mind. You are either spiritual in the mind or you are carnal in the mind. Carnality is in the mind. That is why if you remember we said that the mind is tutored or mentored or fathered by the spirit via the written word. Remember that? Then look at verse 8 and 9 of Romans chapter 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Next verse. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, or since that the spirit of God dwell in you. So because the spirit of God dwell in you, you are in the spirit. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Look at verse 10 and verse 13. And if Christ be in you, so the spirit of Christ in you is Christ in you. You didn't see that. The spirit of Christ. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, so the spirit of Christ is Christ in you. The body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life. The spirit is life. The spirit is the life of God. The spirit is life because of righteousness. Look at verse 13. But if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Next verse. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Next verse. But you have not received the spirit of bondage. Again is the word for that. The spirit of bondage for that to fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba Father. Now look at verse 16. Likewise, Romans 8, 16. The spirit itself beareth witness. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So you see that there was so much discussion on the spirit. In the Pauline epistles, so much is discussed of the spirit. In fact, look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only will I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit, the Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Next verse. Are you so foolish that having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Having begun where? In the Spirit. So you can see that he points out this vital element in the faith as being in the spirit. So when we say in Christ, we also mean in the spirit. In Christ, what we mean by in the faith is also in the spirit. In Christ, in the faith, in the spirit. So when we say in the spirit or in Christ, we are just interchanging 
what means the same thing in the spirit in christ we're interchangeably using different words to mean the same thing so in romans chapter 8 verse 14 when he says as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god even though we know that that text doesn't refer to guidance alone but it includes guidance because we have the spirit witness the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit the spirit witness that we are the children of god the word witness is the word somatorio somatorio son means together with together with material means an evidence that means the same kind of evidence the same kind of the evidence it says the spirit itself bears witness with son material in the greek we said that word is an active term it's not a past tense son material so every time you see the word son material used is an event or an experience be a witness son material active word referring to an event or an experience look at the use of the word son material in romans chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 for when the gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness that their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another not the word do when they do that is what is in the law is in their conscience what is in the law is in their conscience that's what it means so when it says the spirit beareth witness with it means what is in the spirit is in our spirit in other words you will not find a difference you will not find a distinction you will not find a distinguishing between what is in the law and what is in their hearts we will not find a difference between the spirit that's why he says our spirit he doesn't use the word spirit in plural the spirit bear witness with our spirit not spirits with our spirit the spirit bears witness with our spirit so the spirit is our spirit the spirit is our spirit and it bears witness that we are the children of god Look at Romans chapter 9 verse 1. Still looking at the word son material. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. The word son material. Active term. So the same spirit. Or the spirit of god or the spirit of the son is the same spirit the spirit of god the spirit of the son our spirit same spirit again you look at romans chapter 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in christ has made me free from the law of sin and death the spirit of life is in christ so in christ is in the spirit of life 
Romans chapter 8 verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is none of his. Notice the word, the spirit. That word, the spirit now, summarizes everything we have been talking about. Look at Romans 8 verse 10 and 11. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So the spirit is life. The spirit or in Christ is life. Look at verse 11. Oh, glory to God. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, because the spirit is life, if that spirit dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead. So that's why verse 16 will now say, the spirit bears witness with our spirit. Because he has told you that our spirit is called the spirit of adoption. Our spirit is called the spirit of sons. It's not like a garment you wear, you know, and then pretend. No. The spirit of sons is the life. The life of sons or the DNA of sons. The spirit of sons. Having said that, so the spirit of God and the spirit of the son are saying the same thing. We have the spirit of Christ used once. We have the spirit of the Lord Jesus. Then we have the spirit testifying of Christ, which is in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 11 and 12. So here he says, it's the same spirit. Now listen very carefully, everybody. The spirit of God and the spirit of his son is the same. When we have son material, it simply means that what you find in one is in the other. What you find in one is in the other. There will be no distinction. The distinction will not be in quality. It will be in quantity. And I will explain that quickly. That is what it means is, what is in Mr. A is in Mr. B. The only difference is that A is not B. That's the most carnal way I can explain that. See that? Having said that, because... I need you to settle this in your mind. That the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of his son is our spirit. No distinction, no distinguishing, no difference. There are no two spirits in Christianity. There are no two spirits in Christianity. Once you settle that, there are no two spirits in Christianity that is the same spirit, one spirit. One spirit. Then 1 Corinthians chapter 2 will now teach us how to function. How to function as spiritual entities going forward. You know, because if we are looking at the inward witness, if you notice so far in the series of this particular teaching on concerning leadings and perceptions, we have so far said so much about guidance through the gifts of the spirit, prophecy, tongues, interpretation. But you know, 
this first corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 is really where we are going in this series we want to see how the spirit functions how the spirit functions remember we have said that the word witness is an active term it's not like a stamp lying dormant is an active term that's why the word son material material means to voice out to voice out material means to give credible evidence material also means to witness of or to witness to to witness of or to witness to words that are spoken over you words that have gone before you that carries within it the plan the purpose the intent of god and the motive of god for your life Because no child of God is an accident. God, before the foundation of the world, has chosen you in Christ. Oh, he foreknew you ahead of time and predestinated you and called you in Christ Jesus, justified you to glorify you. So there's a definite, specific plan of God for your life. Functioning in that plan is success now functioning in that plan will bring peace it will bring fulfillment and it will bring pleasantness when we speak in tongues and interpret and when we prophesy they are words of the spirit remember you are in the spirit you are in the spirit. Look at First Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. This charge I commit unto this son Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Notice what he said. Timothy, you have utterance concerning you. Words have been spoken concerning you. Then he said, you have to war a good warfare. So when it comes to directions, I have a responsibility. Whatever Paul said here requires clarification. First and foremost, Utterances are directions of the spirit that passes through the human mind. Utterances are directions of the spirit that passes through the human mind. They pass through the human mind. That's why Paul calls it prophecies. Utterances of the spirit that comes via the understanding of the human mind. They exhort, they edify, and they comfort the church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 3. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Now, they pass through the human mind. Which means that the nature of utterances demands clarification. When I give an utterance or when I have a revelation or a vision, it demands clarification on its own. Remember, we spoke about tongues and in tongues we say we have mystery. For he that speaketh in tongues speaketh not to men, but unto God. For no man understandeth, how be it 
in the spirit where you are, you speak mystery. The word mystery is the Greek word mysterion. Mysterion. Mysterion implies knowledge. It implies wisdom and insight that are disclosed to the human mind. Knowledge, wisdom, and insight that are disclosed to the human mind. So he says, I now receive an utterance like Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Which means I now receive an utterance, and he says, when I receive a prophecy, a revelation, an utterance, God speaks to me, whether directly or via prophecy, which is tongues and interpretation, he says, it is now my responsibility to wage a good warfare. Let's look at the word warfare. You know, a lot of people, because they do not understand biblical terms, when they hear warfare, they think of WWF. World Wrestling Federation, where somebody carries somebody and throws on the ground and wins the fight. But the word warfare is different. Even the word wrestle, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, doesn't mean the same with wrestling in English language. Because the Bible has its own language and that's why we teach so we can bring you to a place of understanding. So let's deal with that word warfare. The word warfare is the Greek word stiatio. S-T-I-A stiatio. T-E-U-O. Stiatio. You will see the use of that word warfare in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. No man that warreth, warfare, warreth, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. No man that wore red. You will see the use of that word statio in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. James chapter 4 verse 1. James 4 1. The war among your members. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lost, that war in your members. First Peter chapter 2 verse 11. We're doing exegesis on that word warfare. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So there is lust that is warring against the soul. Where you see the word statue, that means there are things you battle with. And almost every time you see that word used, like I have quoted for you, it has to be with thoughts or emotions. That word warfare always is used within the confines of thoughts or emotions. It's not used against fellow human beings. It's used against thoughts and emotions. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Next verse. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Next verse. Look at the strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. So it is imagination and thoughts to the obedience of Christ. So the warfare is not against another fellow human being. The warfare is within myself. A warfare going on inside me against contradicting thoughts, against contrary emotions that disobey what Christ has done. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. He is still dealing with thoughts and emotions here. Same thing with James chapter 4 verse 1. You know the lusts that war against your members. James 4 1. The lusts that war against your members. Then 1 Peter 2 11. Still deal with the lusts that war against your mind. So he's dealing with passions, imaginations, thoughts, emotions, passions. All are within the man who has received a prophecy. He has received a prophecy and there are thoughts, there are emotions, there are passions that seek to contradict what God has told him. So that means the warfare is in prophecies or with prophecies to deal with thoughts, ideas, and emotions. Which means I can interpret prophecies in the light of my emotions. <laughs> you know, the lady who is prophesying and begins to say, don't say the Lord. Oh, oh, I, the Lord, I'm crying. She has allowed her emotions to get in the way of prophecy. Because God doesn't cry. And even if God is crying, that is not how God will cry. Oh, oh. So that shows you that there is her personality interfering with that prophecy. And that is where the war is. To be able to remove the person and let the message gain preeminence. Which means I can interpret prophecies in the light of my lusts or my own appetite. The guy who walked to a lady and said, Thus say of the Lord, Kotima Kalito Mokota Nakata, you are my husband. I mean, the man said, You are my wife. And the lady looked at him and said, Don't say the Lord, you are not my husband. See that? They allowed their emotions and their desires and passions to color that prophecy. Now, and God's method is man. God has no other medium other than man. So that's why he said you will wage a good warfare. Which is a secondary word to this word. Is the word statia. Statia. S-T-A-T-E-I-A. -E used for service. Statia. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For the weapons of our warfare. Now, let's examine a parable Jesus gave on warfare. Luke chapter 14 verse 30 to 32. Stay with me. Saying, 
this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king? Seated not down first and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. What Jesus is saying is who goes to warfare and does not sit down and begin to count the cost. He does not sit down to say, how do I go about this? What do I need? What do I require in order for me to win? So when I have a prophecy, in that prophecy, there is a warfare. And that warfare is primarily in my mind. In my mind. That warfare is primarily in my thoughts. In my thoughts, that's the first place. Primary in my thoughts and primary in my mind. And that warfare can affect my interpretation. So, I must first of all clarify precisely what is this utterance speaking about precisely. What is this utterance communicating? I have seen people whom I believe or who had something. But they interpreted what they had wrong. See? They heard from God very well. But when they were to interpret, there was a problem with their perception of what God said. They make conclusions that don't truly represent what God said. Let's say a typical example because probably that is the reason for the spirit witness. You know? That's why at the beginning of this teaching I said that you must recognize the spirit precisely. Again, I said all transes will always pass through where? The mind. All transes will always pass through the mind. Whether you are the one giving it or receiving it, it will pass through the mind. Whether I am the one prophesying to you or you are hearing the prophecy from me, both of us, the interplay of understanding between what I say and what you are hearing will be my mind to your mind. So it will still pass through the mind. Please stay with me, it is very important. It will still pass through the mind. That's why Paul never asked us to judge tongues. There's no scripture that asks the believer to judge tongues. Brother Paul only asks us to judge the things that are said in the interpretation of tongues. We don't judge tongues, but we judge the things that are said in the interpretation of tongues. Look at 1 Corinthians 14.29. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. The judge here is not a judging of the tongues, but rather a judging of what has been interpreted to see if it agrees with the word of God. He didn't say judge tongues, but judge interpretation. Now look at this, Acts chapter 20, verse 23. Observe when the utterances came to Paul. Save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. The Holy Ghost witnessed. So the utterances came to Brother Paul that there are bonds and affliction awaiting him in every city. The utterances came because they have revelation in them. Look, there is trouble awaiting you in every city. Then, those disciples in Acts 21, there is trouble. Agabus also in the same 21 looked at Paul. 
there is trouble. But what they spoke out was, look at Acts 20, 22. Please stay with me. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing, not knowing. His spirit is compelled by the inward witness to go to Jerusalem. He knows that Jerusalem he must go. But he does not have the details of what will happen in Jerusalem. So the inward witness gave him direction as to go to Jerusalem. I go bound in the spirit. I go compelled. Or I am held in the spirit to go this way. When he insisted on going, the brethren concluded, let the will of the Lord be done. What they meant is, go by the preferred will. Now notice, he said, not knowing. I have a witness, but I, ha I don't have the details. Acts 20, 23 again. Save that, I don't know, save that the Holy Ghost witnessed. I have a witness by utterance in my spirit saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. I am compelled to go in the spirit, not knowing, save that the spirit witnessed. That means utterance. So the utterance dealt with the facts and the events. The utterance dealt with the facts and the events, but they were not clear cut as to the direction Paul should take. It talked about the facts and the event, but didn't give Paul a direction. So that is where the inward witness comes. Because the inward witness gave him direction. Paul, Jerusalem, you will go. But there are bonds and afflictions. I go bound. That is, I'm compelled in my spirit to go to Jerusalem. Even though the utterances that I am hearing are pointing to the fact that there is trouble in Jerusalem. But my spirit is saying, in spite of the trouble, I must go there. That's what God wants me to do. But the utterances, the prophecy, Agabus took the ghetto. Whoever owns this, the way I'm tying this ghetto, he will be bound. And the brethren told me not to go, but my spirit said I must go. The inward witness how to interplay between the inward witness in the midst of all trans gifts. So the all trans came, but there's a good warfare I have to fight. Whether you like it or not, your thoughts, your emotions will always come in to interfere with direction. But it says in Acts 20:24. 20, Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. So that I might finish my cause with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. To testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now. This verse 24 is as a result of verse 22, not 23. Look at verse 22, Acts 20, 22. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Then look at verse 24, Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. Even though I don't know, I know that there's problem, 
but I'm not moved. Whatever it is, my spirit is compelling me to go. So I shall not be distracted. I shall not be dissuaded by the bonds and the afflictions that before, I don't know the details of the kind of problem waiting, but nothing is going to deter me. He made a confession out of not knowing the things that shall befall me. But I am compelled. How did Paul learn to follow through? How did he learn to follow through? In spite of the threat. Because he has learned to follow the inward witness. Every child of God must learn to follow the inward witness. And for those of you that are just joining this teaching now, I have already done a series that has been running for six months now on this. I've done a series on basics of direction, following the inward witness, leadings and perceptions, plan purposes and pursuits, then back to concerning leadings and perceptions. All these I have taught. You may need to go back, get all of the series so that you have the complete picture of what we're teaching because this is something you will need all your life till you leave this world. You cannot do without it. Now, if you are not someone that knows precisely the witness of the Spirit, with those prophecies, you will have said like Brother Paul, Ah, thank God, I will just stay in Antioch. Jerusalem, I'm not coming. Ah, so Wahala is waiting for me. I'm not coming. But because he knows how to follow the inward witness, even though the utterance told him there's danger, the inward witness supersedes the threat. So against all utterances, gifts of the spirit, he followed the inward witness. Remember he also said, not knowing, save the Holy Ghost, Witnessed in every city, yet he was compelled. Look at Acts chapter 27, verse 9 and 10. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, <laughs> because the fast was now already passed, Brother Paul admonished them. Next verse. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive, that's a word to underline, I am perceiving that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. That's what I'm perceiving. I'm not saying God is telling me. This is my perception of what God is saying. This is my interpretation of what I'm hearing from God, that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. Not only of the laden and sheep, even our lives will be damaged. And this is how our perception could be wrong. This is how our perception could be wrong. That's why the teaching is called leadings and perceptions. God is leading, but the question is in my mind, what am I perceiving? The spirit is speaking, but how renewed is my mind to receive the right signal? Remember, the problem is not with leading. The problem is with the perception. Leading is like the TV station. Perception is like your television set in your house. That your set is shaking and all the pictures are shaking doesn't mean that's what came from the TV station. You may need to check your antenna. You may need to check the quality of your television because the quality of television will tell me how the pictures come out. There are some televisions, if, you, if the pictures come, you'll see the pictures neck shaking like... <laughs> those black and white old televisions. And then there are sharp ones where the picture comes out as if you're going to touch the person. It is not from the station. It is your antenna and your TV set. So God could be saying something, but if your antenna and your mind is not renewed, you will be receiving signal that is shaking head like this. So that's why Paul said, I am perceiving oh, that this journey, 
the ship will be destroyed. Even we, our lives will be destroyed. That is what I'm perceiving. Stay with me. You must be very careful of people whose prophecies are always negative. Every time I see danger, I see bad things, I see disaster, you will die. I see sickness, I see bad things coming. Be careful with those people. Because except you are instructed, those people will always want to use those prophecies to manipulate and control you with fear. In fact, when you as a child of God see something wrong in a vision or revelation, don't tell the person. Pray about it, take authority and stand in faith. You don't need to tell the person. It's not the person God revealed it to. It's you. It's not because the person that the vision concerns is stronger than God. The same way God showed you could have shown the person. But he showed you because he wants you to take responsibility and stand in faith for your brother. So you take responsibility and stand in faith. And no one and be sharing the vision and intimidating the person and manipulating him. That's wrong. You pray and stand in faith. Refuse that and stop it. We, we pray for each other. That's, that's how it is. Because telling them is to instigate fear. If they say need to give an instruction based on the vision, you could just say, brother, one, two, three, be very careful. Or one, two, three, do like this. Give the instruction, but don't bring the fear factor into it. Are we together here? That's how to operate. That's how to function with the things of the spirit. Sometimes telling the person will make it come to pass. Because once you speak it and the person is in fear and the person does not overcome that fear, fear is a connector to the object of the fear. When you fear something, you're already connected to that thing. That's why God doesn't give us fear. Because fear connects you to evil. Faith connects you to God and to good things. Fear is faith perverted. Fear is negative faith. The reason why you're afraid is because you believe that that thing is powerful and it has the ability to happen. That's why you're afraid. Otherwise, you won't be afraid. So fear already means you believe in that thing. It's faith in perversion. So that's why God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love of power and of a sound mind. 365 times in the Bible, fear not, fear not one for every day you wake up. Simon, Simon, Jesus said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. He didn't say, let us pray. I have prayed for you. I saw evil coming. I've taken care of it. It won't come again. You will be restored. Strengthen your brethren. He didn't say, let us pray. He didn't say, I'm seeing evil coming. Can we pray? No. Jesus said, I have taken care of it in prayer. It will not happen again. So when a revelation is given you, take care of it in prayer on behalf of your brother or sister. Take care of it in prayer. I have prayed for you. Now, Paul said in Acts 27, 9, Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was not dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Now, if you remember, he was not in Rome. But experiences have made Paul to start perceiving other things. I'm sure he was like, oh no. <laughs> All those prophecies are going to come to pass. Remember they told him, there'll be trouble, there'll be trouble, there'll be trouble. I just seen a vision, there'll be trouble. Thus says the Lord, there'll be trouble. He said, don't break my heart. I have a witness to go. Huh? I have a witness to go. Now he gets in the ship and there's trouble. And now he says, I'm perceiving we will all die. So I'm sure by his perception, he must have started saying, oh, and they warned me. Not once, not twice, not three times. I wish I listened to stay back. Now he was allowing the utterances be cloud his conviction of the inward witness. 
In fact, Brother Paul's interpretation is that nobody will survive. I hope you know that what Paul was saying here is utterance. You know, Paul spoke by the Spirit, but he didn't speak by the Spirit precisely. Exactly what the folks told him was what he did. They told him by the Spirit not to go. How did they tell him by the Spirit? Tongues and interpretation. The interpretation Paul had here was they will all die, none will live. Later on, Brother Paul got clarification. So there are two things as I begin to round up. Number one, there was revelation. And number two, there was utterance. It was not different from Acts 21.5. Put it up for me. Acts chapter 21 verse 5. And when we had accomplished these days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Now look at Acts 27, 22 now. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. But of the sheep. The first perception is said, both the sheep and our lives will be destroyed. But after a while, he had clarity of what the spirit was saying. He now said to them, hey, there shall be no loss of life. None of us will die. Only the sheep. Give me 23, 27, 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. So when God saw that Paul was not getting the message clearly, he now sent an angel to help Paul get clarity. The angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, give me the next verse. Whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God had given thee all them that sail with thee. Next verse, 25. Wherefore, sirs, he now is speaking to the people in the ship with him. Be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told. Like Brother Hagin will say, it's better to be slow than to be faster than God. Supposing the people believed him when he said, we will die. And they started jumping into the water to swim out. They will have died. A wrong perception of what the spirit is saying can get you in trouble. Supposing they had believed Paul that there will be danger and trouble and they started jumping out and falling into the water. Acts 27 verse 9 and verse 10. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them. Next verse. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the laden and ship, but also of our lives. So when he said this, supposing those that can swim started jumping out so that they don't die, that will have been a perception that is not accurate, that brought destruction. So that's why we must, we must be slow. When you perceive what the Spirit is saying, wait and pray a little more. Check it in light of Scripture. Check it in light of Scripture. Now, so whose responsibility was to ensure that what Paul now said comes to pass? Was it God's responsibility or Paul? Paul. Paul said, I believe God that it shall be as it was told me that no life will be lost. He had to believe that is warfare. He stood with God's word and refused to bow to the contrary circumstances. Because God said, I have given the life of all those in the sheep in your hands. So Paul now speaks to them. there seems to be a contradicting utterance. One said we will die. One said we will not. So he now had the responsibility to give direction to the whole sheep. 
you are responsible for your perception. Now, where do we get perceptions? What compartment of the body do we receive perceptions in? The mind. Perceptions come to the mind. That's why the mind must be renewed and developed by the word of God to think in line with the spirit. Where did Paul get it wrong? In his interpretation of what God was saying. In the mind. What he said, was it by the spirit? Yes. Because it came via utterance. But his interpretation of what the spirit was saying was where the problem was. So which means when we hear from God and we perceive what God is saying, we must seek for clarification. That's where counsel comes. That's where patience comes. Because in major decisions, you need to calm down. Many believers live in condemnation and fear because in their words, they say they are obeying God. How can you be obeying God in condemnation and fear when the spirit of God is not the spirit of condemnation and the spirit of God is not the spirit of fear? How does that work? Anywhere there's fear and condemnation, God is not there. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. There is therefore now no condemnation. So once there's condemnation, that's not God. Once there's fear, that's not God. God doesn't function in fear and condemnation. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. So it's important that we find out clarification when we have utterance. Paul said the man who has nothing in eternity will be saved by salvation. But that person will suffer loss. There are people who are supposed to be in ministry. But they have abandoned ministry. Are gone into politics. They have gone into business. And they are not thinking of serving the purpose of God at all. And they live with condemnation because they know that where they are is not where they should be. And one thing with condemnation is it will keep you going from one wrong direction to another. Because once there's condemnation, you keep going, you just keep going further and further away from God. Condemnation will drive you completely away from God. And that's why you must ensure that you handle perceptions with care. That's where the word, the inward witness comes. You follow the inward witness. Learn to recognize how the born again spirit reacts to things. How the born again spirit speaks. How the born again spirit puts out information. You must be able to recognize effectively how the born again spirit speaks and communicates and how the inward witness functions. And you must be able to know how to interplay the inward witness with all trans gifts, tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. And of course, you engage in warfare to ensure that your mind, your thoughts, your reasonings, your emotions are subject to the word of God. So that way your feelings and emotions do not interfere with your perceptions. You fine tune. How do you fine tune? You fine tune by learning, by growth, by receiving the word, and by counsel. Every one of you will walk in the plan and the purpose of God for your life. Every one of you will follow God's purpose and you will live out the realities of God and you will serve your generation with the call of God upon your life. No one will be a mistake. No one will be a misfit. No one will do trial and error. No, 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 no. It will be precision and accuracy. Walking and living in God's purpose and God's plan. Enjoying fulfillment. Enjoying boldness and confidence. And walking in the realities that are yours in Christ Jesus. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Amen. 